Hello, you're watching Hotel Designs Live On Demand. This session was recorded live at Minotti London on the 10th of August, 2021. Enjoy. Welcome back to Hotel Designs Live with me, Hamish Kilburn, the editor of Hotel Designs. We're broadcasting this edition of Hotel Designs Live from the comfort of Minotti London's contemporary showroom here in Fitzrovia, London. The Italian furniture brand is our headline sponsor and I urge you to come down and check out their latest furniture collections. Before the break, we heard from leading designers on the sensory experience in hotel design, as well as checking in uh, with sleep experts, designers and architects on how to create the perfect sleep setting. Well, now we're zooming in somewhat to look at surface design trends and materials. And to do this, we've invited a handful of designers and hospitality pioneers for a crash course in surface design trends. So without further ado, please welcome Beverly, Derek, uh, Beverly and Derek Jobert, the founders of Great Plains, George Kuyas, the founder of the Interior Design Geek, Shalini Misra, founder and creative director of the Design Buzz, and Fameed Kalik, founder of Fameed Kalik Design Studios. Welcome everyone, how are we? Hi hey, Hamish, how's it going? Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, all good, all good. We've got a truly international panel, which is fantastic. My first question um, really is just going to address the elephant in the room, no pun intended, Beverly and Derek with Great Plains. Um, but COVID-19 is very much a thing that we have to think about. So the first thing I think about, and I think a lot of designers think about when they think about surfaces, sustainability and hygiene. Um, how do we answer both demands? Are there products on the market at the moment that answer to both? What, what, what have we found when doing our research? Well, Joy, let me just... Oh, yeah. or Beverly and Derek, either or. <laughs> uh, your it just sounds like you're in a furniture making store there, so that's good. Um, <laughs> just as we've started, in fact, there's some drilling next door, but it's, it's always the way. But I think we should just keep calm and carry on. Put one to go ahead. George, do you want to kick start us off yeah. just in regards to anything that you've seen on the market recently and the, the ethos behind your brand that's newly launched is very much being geeky about the details. Yeah. So what is it that's exciting you at the moment? I, so to answer your question, there's a sort of short answer and a long answer. The short answer is it's actually quite difficult to achieve both. Um, when you're when when products are man-made and to be durable and wipeable and hygienic there's usually a process that goes into that which means the eco credentials of the product sort of diminish i'll give you an example so paint you know we use it everywhere in our houses and on one end of the scale we've got eco natural paints like bow work that are beautiful i use them all the time they're like lime wash paint they're very on trend at the moment and um, they have they give no toxins into the environment they're sort of really natural they have um, really uh, good eco credentials the problem is they're they're not wipeable you know if you sneezed on a bow wall um, you'd have to paint over it um, on the other end of the scale you've got oil-based traditional paints and they are wipeable but they're VOC figures are really terrible, you know, with, you know, high VOC content. Um, so, so, so it's quite difficult finding something in between that sort of caters to both, I guess. Because well, as the, soon as the you majority take... of paints we use, sorry to interrupt, paints, the majority of paints we use, all these big brands we use, are sort of somewhere in the middle. They've got sort of low VOC content and they are wipeable um, and they're, they're sort of called eco paints. But there are a couple of companies that I think are doing it properly. So one company is called mm. Little Nights, and they were born, I think, for kids' bedrooms originally. And they have zero <laughs> VOC, they're odorless, they're wipeable, and they've added some sort of ant antibacterial agent into the paint. So I think they tick both boxes. Um, and then another company that I've used are called Coat. And they 
they have an ethos of sustainability throughout their entire manufacturing process. So they do have VOCs, but you can recycle tins. They don't do little uh, test pots. They do sort of little chits with color so you don't waste. Um, so yeah, there are some people who are doing it, some independents who are doing it really well. Um, and everyone is sort of in the middle somewhere, trying to navigate this hygiene sustainability story. Yeah, well, I, I guess as soon as the demand goes up for, for uh, brands to just authentically and innately <laughs> ensure that they're sustainable, then the more accessible these products will, will become as well. Um, Beverly and Derek, from, from your perspective, so just a bit of a background. So you guys are filmmakers uh, by, by trade, and then you set up Great Plains to um, fund your wildlife conservation work, which is a fascinating story in itself. But in that, you, you are filmmakers designing hotels and designing safari camps in Africa. Um, what process did you sort of go through when, when you were uh, specifying the materials and surfaces for your camps? Because I know that sustainability is a big pillar in, in how you're growing as a company. Well, oh, very definitely. And now suddenly, so we went from sustainability and you're right, we're storytellers. We do tell stories through our designs and, the, and everything that we use within the camps. Um, and suddenly we went from that storytelling ethos into what George is talking about, how we deal with this in a, in a COVID world. So in, in our designs, we use rough hardwoods, canvas, brass, copper, and now suddenly we were confronted with the, the sort of decision, do we now switch out some of those for stainless steel and, and um, plastic, for example? Um, and we've just gone down the route of saying, look, we're in the hospitality business, we're not in the hospital business. And so we just have to be careful about fogging, cleaning these surfaces and just making sure that we're doing our very best without eroding the design and the entire storytelling around it. Do you think that you're quite unique in the um, in the market for, for going into that depth of research where, when it comes to materials, uh, when looking at other brands, for example? I mean, I, I see your brand, Great Plains, as quite a family-owned, um, family-run brand, so I guess you're more sort of uh, involved in the decisions as they move forward. Um, let me say, you, you, you're very right. Um, we take um, on every aspect of getting a camp design. So from the beginning, Derek, you know, we'll design um, the tents and we'll bring in um, a tent maker. Everything will be bespoke. What we like to do, and this is probably through um, 40 years of travel and understanding the uniqueness of beautiful items around the world and the connection, you know, in, um, in Kenya, for instance, and Swahili is really a wonderful blend of Arabic, um, of Indian, and of course, the local culture. And then, of course, um, you know, having uh, the British colonial come through. And so it gave us a lot of opportunity to look at all these cultures and see how they connected at this one particular point in Kenya. And then, of course, you know, we could play with that um, in, in, in the camp. But I think what we also like to do is not only do we like the items to be um, bespoke and unique to our camp, so if we can, we will make a lot of it but we'll make it out of recycled wood so for instance you know the railway sleepers that were um, cut 100 years ago and now have been replaced with cement we now using that for our decks for our flooring uh, recycle is important we will never cut down a forest for our camps uh, the same with uh, recycle uh, certain furniture when the tsunami in 2004 hit indonesia we had connections in indonesia and they accumulated a lot of the wood and we had beautiful bespoke um, items made, you know, as furniture for the, the Zorafa cap. So unique um, and antique is really important to bring that authentic and organic feel to all the cats. Of course, of course. And um, uh, Shalini, I want to bring you into the conversation as well, very much just to sort of back what uh, Beverly and Derek have just said in regards to sustainability being a huge pillar in, I think, a lot of people's minds. Um, is it difficult to uh, bring in reclaimed uh, materials into luxury products or, or what projects, sorry, what, what are the challenges um, when doing so? 
You know, it's a very valid question, Hamish, and I've been thinking about it since COVID struck because I think it's the need of the hour. And um, I've, I've done some research and I think, um, uh, I think every material can be sustainable if it's a reclaimed version of it. And obviously we're not using new resources because it's reclaimed, so it is sustainable. But when it comes to hygiene, some surfaces are naturally more hygienic than the others. Um, surfaces that are smooth and are easy to clean and don't require harsh products to clean them are obviously good options. Bamboo is one of my favorite sustainable materials as it's highly renewable, very quick to grow, and there is a lack of pesticide that you use to make it eco-friendly. Uh, it can be used as timber for flooring, it can be used for furniture, I've used it as rugs. So it's quite a versatile material and has many different uses. It has antibacterial properties. Um, any reclaimed smooth surface like marble, smooth shining marble, not porous marble like travertine. And stones are another good option, I think, for um, um, hygienic surfaces. Reclaimed to be sustainable and smooth, so it's easy to clean as rough, uneven surfaces are harder to clean and provide areas for bacteria to foster. When it comes to worktops, I find steel, quartz, granite are most hygienic materials. Using reclaimed quartz and granite could make them more sustainable to help preserve natural resources. Granite, of course, needs to be properly polished and sealed as it is porous in its natural state. Steel, as we all know, is endlessly recyclable and it also has antibacterial property, has long durability and requires little maintenance. And now it can come in many different colors. So I think it's quite a versatile material. You know, it can look quite gold if you want it to be or brass or bronze. It, it can be colored in many different ways. So I find that quite a quite a smart surface to use nowadays. Hmm. And um, for me, I wanted to bring you in um, as well. So you're you're known um, uh, quite authentically as the king of surfaces. Uh, where we we referenced you as that in, in one of our articles, um, mainly because of the experiential surfaces that you create. What would you say are the most wacky and bizarre surfaces that you've you've um, designed in your studio? Um. You know, we have this reputation and we do do the odd exotic thing, <laughs> <laughs> such as hand embroidered rabbit fur walls and um, semi precious stone arches. But, you know, realistically, most of the work that we do is very prosaic, it's very practical. Um, and it's really driven by the need of the designer, especially in hospitality. Uh, and usually there's a, a problem to solve. It's either the designer doesn't know where to get it made, or there's a budget constraint, or there's a lead time issue. Um, so, you know, just to give you a couple of examples, we were working on, we are working on a hotel project um, in the Middle East where the designer had specified real straw marquetry walls for the bar. And the walls were meant to be starbursts, very, very big walls, three meters by three meters. And you can't use straw marquetry in that context. It's, it's one, it would be way too expensive. And two, straw marquetry isn't meant to be used on large expanses. You can't do it. Um, so we worked with the designer and we found a solution for them, which involved using sustainable uh, uh, renewable wood, Paolunia wood, and creating a wood veneer finish that looks just like straw marquetry, but you can use it on large expanses and it literally goes up like, like a wallpaper and it's a fraction of the cost. And that's a good example of what, what we do. You, know, you try and find a solution and that then rolled out into a whole collection for us of, of a wall covering that looks like straw marquetry, gives you the whole vibe of it, but that's much more um, sustainable and, um, and more cost effective. Mm. Wow. Um, George, I just wanted to bring you back yeah. in because you've, um, you've worked in, in a number of corners of the arena from uh, you know, residential uh, to hospitality, bars, restaurants, and even theatres. Mm. What but your, your majority of your work at the moment is, is residential. What, what do you think the industry can take from residential design into hospitality when it comes to the services that are being specified and the services that you're looking at and like certainly in regards to like bringing um, nature indoors and using materials that are a little bit more I don't know I guess personalized to, to the con end consumer I guess as opposed to just a standard cookie cutter approach to interior design. Wow that's a big question um, I think 
<laughs> I think when my clients approach me, they have a sort of hierarchy of questions. The first thing is all about look and feel. So effectively, uh, and actually it's not what we've just been discussing. I'll give you the hierarchy. So the first thing is they've mm. seen something on in a magazine or on hotel designs or on Pinterest and they've gone, does this work in my house? You know, can, can this work? I've seen it uh, in a magazine in New York. Um, and at the moment, the current trend is bringing this outdoor in. They're using, you know, external tiles in bathrooms or the reverse. You know, people are, people are wanting to go quite natural and organic. Um, the second thing is about function. So people are asking, can I use this as a worktop? Can I use this on, the, on a floor in my shower? Um, the third thing is about availability and about price at the moment and getting stuff mm. from Europe. And I was thinking about you asking me earlier about sustainability. That is not coming up at the moment with clients. That's pretty interesting. You, you know, people aren't saying, you know, is this a porcelain tile, not a ceramic? Is this worse for the environment? That's just not a mm. thing. But I think what's interesting about that is because that's from a residential perspective, that's perhaps not on the agenda, which you would assume it would be. But from a brand's perspective, that really is on the agenda at the moment, which I think you would presume historically that brands wouldn't really care about that sort of thing. They're just caring about look and feel, whereas the consumer would care more about the authenticity of how their home feels and where things come from. But that's interesting that you say that. Yeah. So, you know, we're using, you know, the last couple of years, we've been using cement tiles everywhere. You know, they're external cement tiles inspired, you know, from the original Moroccan tiles. We're using them in bathrooms. We're using them in kitchens as splashbacks. And they are beautiful and they're all over the magazines, but no one's ever said, you know, cement manufacture is really bad for the environment, right? I mean, I love using them. So I guess to balance it out, you've got to put things in front of your clients based on the companies that you think have a good ethos. You're, you're showing people the way without sort of saying, use this company because they've got better eco credentials, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, and a question to everyone, and I'm, I'm quite quite nervous to ask this because I'm aware that interior designers notoriously hate the words trends, but I just want to know what, what would you say are the trends and how do you react to interior design trends when every time you look at a project, every project is different and every project requires a different surface and a different need um, to the others. So, so how do you identify what's a trend and what's not? And do you even look at trends as a, as a whole? <laughs> it's for anyone. Misra, maybe you can start. Shalini. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm sure none of the interior designers will admit to be following trends. And I think trend is a short-lived word, so no one really wants to adhere to it. But I think the most sustainable way to design is with longevity in mind. So this means using surfaces and materials that are hard bearing, long lasting and looks timeless. So trends do sometimes return, they do. And experience is a, you know, a renewed appreciation of the trend, such as an example of maybe terrazzo, like you mentioned, George, of using cement and yeah. marble, waste marble chips, which is very popular in the 1920s and has made a huge comeback now. In some ways it's sustainable because it has marble waste and, um, and it means that it may be here to stay, we don't know. As designers, we are so spoilt with choice and I think um, you really need to be a curator of all of the designs, materials, styles, and they're constantly being developed. So you need to judge what holds value. And it may be that something that is a trend is something that you do find beautiful and it'll become a, a something, a favorite that you'll use for many projects to come. So I, I don't know if trend is short-lived or not anymore. Uh, yeah, I, I think also when, when I've read interior design trends in the past, sustainability has always crept up. I feel as if now every trend is kind of incorporating sustainability. So it's becoming more of a movement as opposed okay. to a trend in itself as well. George, sorry, you wanted to say something. No, I was just going to say, well, I totally agree with you, Hamish, but I completely agree with Shalini. You've got to <laughs> choose things that are timeless because effectively, if you want to be sustainable, you don't want someone changing their 
flooring every time there's a new trend. That's completely unsustainable. Yeah. So you're choosing things that will last for years. And part of the design process is making people look at trends because that is what clients will come to you with. They will say, this is a new trend. I want, I want a green kitchen because everyone's having green kitchens at the moment. Um, mm. What you don't want them to turn around in two years time and say, I want a, I want a blue kitchen because everyone's having blue kitchens, right? You've got, you've got to go through the process. So the decisions that they make are long-term. And as Shalini said, you've got to use timeless, timeless items that won't go out of fashion because yeah, absolutely. you like terrazzo, it's been around for years. Ceramics have been around for years. You don't have to follow each trend, but you, you do get asked things all the time, which are based on what people see in magazines. For example, yeah. this year I've been asked for fluted furniture 25 times. Like it's, it's everywhere. You know, everyone, wants, everyone wants textured furniture, right? It doesn't mean it's going to go out of fashion, but it's maybe an art deco thing that's come back and hopefully it'll, you know, when everyone wants flat, go. In three years, <laughs> they won't get rid of it, right? Yeah. No, for sure. And I can imagine, um, Beverly and Derek, that trends don't really come into your vocabulary. Um, in Africa, it's more around, you know, creating that authentic uh, environment. And that's very much sort of sense of place where, where you are, um, which is, I think, very different to, um, you know, the hotels being designed in, in sort of Western, um, you know, urban areas as well. And I think, uh, yeah, materiality, I'm, I'm assuming, is, is just the key part of what you're looking for with, with surfaces. Well, I think that uh, it's actually, um, there are trends here. And I find that a lot of the safari lodges and, and hotels in the safari business uh, have now started veering into a combination of three things. And we kind of joke about it. So glass and steel and beige. Um, and then, <laughs> which is great, I suppose, but uh, exactly the opposite of what we do. Um, but I think that for durability, they go with glass and steel and beige, and then they add accessories on top of that, or they add a touch of color, and then next year they throw it out and get. So they sort of invest in, in a trend uh, much less. So just a touch of blue this year, a touch of green next year, and so on, but on a, on a bed of beige. And um, we do just the opposite. So we yeah. go to hard materials that are going to tell a story from the ground up. So our, we don't really follow trends, but we're certainly aware of them. And, yeah. and I think the, the trend to avoid is to try and modernize all these safari camps. We've got to remember that people are coming to experience, you know, a safari, not to come to a hotel in the bush. And so that's um, what we avoid. If you think of that as a trend, we will avoid it completely. And we will bring that historic um, feel to it. Each camp is almost an alchemy of everything from the culture to whatever hits that country, you know, through the time of safari and that's what will unfold and as Derek says uh, you know it's very important that nature helps create uh, the camp so each camp is vastly different each environment is different each ecosystem is different and so our camps won't have a specific trend all the way through um, at all uh, but they will be under canvas so that I suppose would be one of the trends um, and a lot of it is, is on you, you know recycle word but other than that the storyline and the cultures are so different and the colors are so different because we've taken from the Maasai groups, the, the Maasai tribe um, that only wears purple. So that camp has a huge amount of purple, you know, infused all the way through. And another one that has a huge amount of red. And so we will try so that when guests go from one camp to the other, it's like going um, in through a storyboard, a magical journey. Uh, they will never feel like, oh, they've been to the Great Plains hotels. We don't do that. Yeah, of course. And um, what I find absolutely fascinating in all of this is designers constantly tell me they don't like the words trends. Yeah, only time we write about trends, the, the readership goes like sky high. <laughs> so clearly it's important to see what's on the market and I think the developments as well. We're going to go live to our product watch pitch in just a few moments time. But, but first, um, just one more question. So we started the day with Hotel Designs Live talking about the sensory experience. And I guess with surfaces, the most in 
well, the most obvious sense would be touch. Um, has it become more on people's radars, as in consumers and clients, to ensure that what you're specifying in, in a hotel and in a project uh, has that tactile uh, quality? And it's a question to everyone. So, um, for me, maybe you can start us off. Yeah, I think that definitely um, people want surfaces that are more tactile. But just going back to the question that you asked right at the beginning about mm -hmm. um, hygiene and sustainability, I mean, one of the things that people use a lot is leather, for example. Um, and there's, a, there's been some real um, advances in faux leathers, such as sil silicon leather, which is a microfiber coated in silicon, which where it, it's recyclable, it's allergen free, it's, it's a medical grade. It actually feels and touches exactly like leather but it isn't. Um, and um, yeah, and I think there's fabrics like that too that are suddenly you know, bleach cleanable, antimicrobial. But again, you know, you've got fabrics that aren't real linen, that aren't velvets, but actually feel like velvets and feel like linen. So there is quite a lot of progress being made in things that aren't what they seem to be, but, uh, but mimic something else mm. that are very mm. tactile. Where, where's, where's that progress coming from? So, so is that the demand from designers or would you say that's uh, consumers that are then demanding the designers then go to the suppliers or is that suppliers kind of cottoning onto it anyway, or is it a mixture between all three? I think it's a mixture. It's what? definitely led by designers, I think, because we, you know, we mm -hmm. our clients are designers, and it's you know uh, you, we were talking about um, trends earlier on. But I think there's de you, you use the word movement, and I think there definitely has been a movement. We've noticed it in the last eighteen months, even before COVID, that there was a movement towards craft and artisanship and natural materials oh, and heritage fibers. And I think COVID has just made that an even stronger movement. Um, and it, you yeah. know, it started with designers. It started with things that we were creating, and I think. Um, the consumers are picking it up now. I and mean, certainly we've had clients and clients where we're doing a house or we're doing a yacht where they're demanding these kinds of materials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think from, from my perspective, I always feel as if I don't know enough about surface design because there's so much to talk about and there's so much evolution happening and experiment. Um, uh, experimenting happening as well and um, so we're going to go live to our product watch pitch and we're going to join you guys back in a minute so if you could just uh, turn off your cameras and we'll welcome our product watch pitch partners and we're going to start with a pitch from Hamilton Light Stats. so we've got a video for you now <laughs> Hamilton, um, well, I would love to say that they've got their showroom um, back open now in London. So if you want to get in contact with them, then, then you can do so. But I also wanted to mention that they have a fantastic case study that we reported on uh, last year, which is the Waterside Inn, where they really blended their, their products into the, the, the wallpapers as well. Up next, we have a product watch pitch from Schluter Systems. Hello, 
I'm David Villafuerte, and I'm one of the specification consultants at Schluter Systems. I've been employed by Schluter now coming up to six years, and spent the best part of 22 years within the tile and stone industry. Schluter Systems are a market leading manufacturer for solutions for tile and stone installations. In a nutshell, we are the mechanics behind the tiles. There is plenty of room for creativity in witness specifications, but your design needs to be backed up with the correct system to balance both form and function. It is imperative that the substrates are designed and constructed to accept either a tile or stone finish. A systems approach, ideally looking at a system from a single manufacturer that can provide waterproofing for the wall and floor, under tile heating if required, uncoupling, drainage and a sloped tray solution. Schluter Curly Board forms part of our waterproofing system and is quick and easy to install. The waterproof backer board has a three layer system built within the panel. It can save you time and money on site, reducing the amount of trades and minimising the amount of products within the build up. There are an array of accessories, channels and curved variants to create custom furniture and features, pre-fabricated corner pieces and various size niches. Curly Board is BBA certified. A couple of project references to leave you with. First up is the renovation of the Newt Hotel and Spa in Somerset. Schluter Curly Board was heavily used in the creation of multiple focal points within the spa area, including the vanity units in the male and female changing rooms. The flexibility of the backboard provided stability for the 20mm Carrara marble on the walls and the blue graduation mosaic installed to the vaulted ceiling. Onto the Headland Hotel in Cornwall, which recently undertook a large scale upgrade involving a brand new spa and swimming area. One eye catching feature which enhanced the look of the spa was a serpentine wall clad with riverstone. This feature wall above the waterline required one of the key Schluter Curly Board products. The variation Schluter Curly Board V, a perfect waterproofing component created specifically for curved areas. Thank you for taking the time to listen to today's product summary, and I look forward to hopefully working with you in the future. And that was Schluter Systems uh, demonstrating that obviously wellness is absolutely huge at the moment. We haven't even touched upon wellness in this panel discussion, so we'll be doing so in the second half. So look forward to that. Uh, next, we have Shelley from Mosaico. Hi, Shelley, are you there? Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Hi, Shelley. Yeah, good, thank you. Do you want to just switch your camera on? There we hey, go. how are you doing? Great. Nice you okay? to see you all. <laughs> Brilliant. Lovely for you to join us. Um, uh, you, you can start whenever you're ready. Perfect, thank you, Hamish. Um, so, Mosaico Plus have been through a significant transformation over the last three years, from that of a traditional mosaic company to one where we're creating a new approach to the mosaic concept, crafting new designs that diversify from what you might ordinarily expect. They don't automatically shout mosaic, but follow the theme in a new guise and can be integrated into your chosen scheme to provide an interesting surface feature of both practical and decorative nature. We've introduced new shapes and materials, very different from the regular square format that we all know and focus strongly on A and D. We have, um, we continue to use mesh to mount some of the new patterns and in these new formats, as you'll see in the P Psycho image, it appears that the grout divides, but also holds the designs together. It also highlights or outlines the pattern. So the grout itself becomes part of the overall surface changing the dynamics and the look of the decoration depending on the colour used. Grout accentuates or blends, whether using contrasting or tonal shades to show off a strong pattern or maintain a seamless surface. But also with our new collection, Cut Up, we've used incisions and applied textures onto a larger slab to create divisions, maintaining smaller pieces as with the regular form of a mosaic. Cut Up is through body porcelain, in 15 by 42 centimetre modules, and we suggest fixing off bond to ensure no obvious repeat and to mix the modules so the embedded textures appear more randomly in the finished installation. The grouted incisions and natural textures divide the larger tile to imitate smaller individual pieces as with the expected mosaic format, uh, breaking up the larger area. So transform with your chosen grout colour and use on walls and floors, interior and external surfaces. Thank you all so much and enjoy the rest Thank of the much, session. Shelley. Thanks so much, Shelley. Thank That's you. brilliant. And it's Thank definitely you. a question I'm going to put forward to the panel in regards to grout, especially. It came onto my um, yeah. agenda a few years ago, it came onto my radar a few years ago, and it's definitely something I want to explore as a, uh, a little uh, tip and a trick to make things a bit more interesting in, in wellness areas for sure. Finally, we Thanks. have uh, Alison from Millican. Hi, Alison. Hi, everybody. My name is Alison Kitchingman. I'm Director of Design and Marketing at Millican. 
So I'd like to introduce Millican to you today. For those that don't know, Millican is a floor covering manufacturer. We supply carpet and luxury vinyl tile with a very strong emphasis on the design and well-being elements. We have global manufacturing and global design studios, including right here in the UK, where we have manufacturing and design for the European market. You might already know Millican as being a major floor covering supplier to the office market, but you might not be quite so familiar with Millican as being a supplier to the hospitality market. In actual fact, from our US base, we've been supplying carpet to the hospitality market for over 40 years. Inspired by Brazilian street art, this is Creo. Powerful, playful, dynamic. A collection designed to emote and excite. Three lively pattern families, Avenida, Beco, Rua. Offered in three vibrant colorways, Rio, Sao Paulo, Brasilia. Select your favorite pattern and color combination for field, runner, or rug installations. And with a robust offering of free technologies, Design flexibility from project to project is always within reach. Printworks, providing rich depth of color, perfectly suited for a wide range of applications. Color point to add textural dimension for visually impactful, solution dyed broadloom designs. Select Axminster for premium woven luxury and high style aesthetic. Infusing interiors with transcending styles. Express yourself with Creo. There we go. And I believe that we have Alison back. Hi, Alison. I hope you don't mind. I just introduced the video for you. <laughs> oh, you're on mute as well. <laughs> no worries. Um, that's the, there we go. Yeah, it did cut off. I think it might have been your internet, but we've, we've we introduced the video for you. So um, I hope that's okay. Okay, great. Um, so that concludes, no worries. Thank you. That concludes our product watch pitch. So I'd like to invite back the uh, audience members, uh, not audience members, the speakers. Uh, and just a reminder that if you have any questions for our speakers, then uh, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen there. So welcome back, everyone. So yeah, my first question really is route. Have we not in the past utilised this as much as we should have done? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear that. Was that for me? Question, sorry, we've got some very annoying drilling happening next door. Um, my first question is grout. So from the product watch pitch um, with Mosaico, for example, they're really utilizing grout. Do you think in the past that we've, that's a trick that may have been missed by some designers, really utilizing the, the color of grout and the contrast between that and the tiles? Yeah, I think potentially that, has happened although for the last 10 years there's been you know companies like Mape who have had so many colors of grout and so many different finishes from really waterproof silicone grout to sand based grout and um at the moment I don't want to talk about friends but there's loads of contrast grouts going you know there's pictures of piles with contrast grouts going going everywhere over the internet so I think people are aware I think every, every time I get asked we always do the exercise with you know, floor tiles, wall tiles, and all the varying degrees of grout that you use. So I think people are more aware than you think. We can't hear you. I've just seen white grout a lot everywhere. Maybe like at some areas, we, we could have been more creative in, in from, from some designers. And um, very sort of attached to that um, is, is wellness. So um, uh, Shalini, I wanted to come to you because you, you wrote an article for us recently on, on trends in wellbeing and how to create that in the luxury space. Um, has anything changed specifically over the last, uh, say, 19 months when we've been in this period of a change in lifestyle as well as COVID-19, obviously, but that new demand for wellness, it was creeping up anyway before COVID? specify services in those areas? I think uh, wellness for me has been intrinsic in my design for the last 20 years. But during the last 19 months during COVID, I think more and more people have started uh, thinking about the importance of wellness in interiors and they are making a huge change in their lifestyles, in the way place they live and now they work. They are trying to integrate as many wellness principles as they can in the interiors, which I'm very happy to observe. 
So for me, um, in surfaces, I think I like to use as many natural materials as possible in, um, in, in, in materials. So they, I think, are proven to be, uh, you know, uh, beneficial to our well-being. Coming into contact with natural materials such as timber, cotton, linen, is a way of including biophilic design um, into our furniture and soft furnishings. Biophilic design is really our connection with nature and it's just bringing as much nature, nature as possible in, inside and one really easy way is to use natural materials to do so. You know, timber, stone, marble, cork, bamboo are all great options for surface materials in this kind of space. They also have very difficult uh, difference or <laughs> different qualities, as you were saying, when you feel them, the tactile nature of them. Uh, thinking of meditation, especially in particular, one has an awareness of sensations and consciousness of our surroundings. And um, having tactile elements in our interior spaces really, really contributes to this. Yeah. Um, uh, for the colors- well, I was gonna the... ask you about the meditation area because that was an area that you, you touched upon in the article um, and where space allows to have that and there's certainly that demand for it I think the the sort of tech free areas in hotels to have areas that are just slightly different and a contrast to the other um, areas of the hotel and I think surface design can play a huge role in that that aspect being tactile yeah exactly and uh, you know you just use for colors the use of tones obviously when you're meditating you're in a completely different zone so you don't really need much but then to create that atmosphere for you to get into that zone is important. So um, I, I use at lighter, more muted tones and subtle, say for example, marble, if you're using in, um, in, in different surfaces. So subtle veining in marble is, um, is, is, is low energy and it's great for reflection, great for relaxation. Uh, for example, a study, bedroom, bathroom. But if you want a high energy space, um, then you use, you know, and combine more intense, more vibrant, more rich colors. Mm -hmm. So you can contrast, um, you know, different spaces for different uses by using yeah. different textures and colors and patterns. Of course. For me, um, I want to ask you, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say the name of the hotel, so I'm not going to, but there's a very well-known hotel development in London that you've been specified to work on. Um, and I wanted to know what the design brief was from the client. I'm sure you um, know what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, no, we can, we can talk about it. It's the peninsula. Oh, the part. <laughs> um, it's been quite a long project for us, actually, about four years. And, um, you know, we, I've worked on hotels for almost 15 years now. And I have to say the standards that um, we were being held to for the materials in this hotel were beyond anything um, I've ever encountered before. So, you know, we worked on the fabrics and the wall coverings in, in every room. Um, but HSH, who own Peninsula, um, whereas in most of the hotels where we've um, created fabrics and wall coverings, any standards that had to be met, as long as you vouched for them yourself or had a certificate from a treatment house, they were accepted. In this case, that wasn't the case. You had to get everything independently verified and tested. Um, and the standards were just you know, off the charts. So it's been quite an interesting learning curve for us to, to go through. Um, and also, you know, they've tried to make it as sustainable as possible as well, as most mm. hotels are right now. Uh, yeah, but it's been, very it been a project that's, that's evolved over time. So there's been like an open window for, for new research to creep in because obviously that hotel project that hotel development has been on the boards for, for a long time now um and i can imagine what was uh you know what you were looking at a few years ago although you're kind of trying to create that timeless uh look and feel it would change naturally with the research and the new products that are on the market as, as you move forward um, and we, the materials in, i guess and as opposed to products yeah i mean not so much with the peninsula because i said it was fabrics and it was wall coverings um but certainly on mm. other hotel projects um, as I said earlier on, that, you know, what, what we do is we try and find a solution to a problem. So, for example, one of the things that hotel designers often shy away from using is acrylic and resin because it scratches. Um, so one, one, of, one of the great advances recently we've been able to come up with is finding a resin that's self-healing. So if, for example, you're using something trapped in an acrylic or resin in an elevator car or lift car, if it gets scratched now, scr gets scratched now you can use a heat gun and it, it's self-healing. Or on a bar top, you can pull the scratches out. So it's things like that where I think there are interesting things that are developing that are really creating solutions for hotel designers. 
mm, almost behind the scenes so the yeah. consumer would never really know it's more around functionality for sure and um, in our last event oh, at hey, Data Science Live we we looked at um, art outside the frame and um, it's just interesting to me because obviously surfaces um, come into that a lot I and mean, are, are there any sort of interesting surface or, or tricks or tips that you can share um, collectively as, as a group that can really sort of uh, enhance a hotel's branding or, or like wallpapers and flooring, for example. Does anyone want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I find that interiors are not complete without art. And I think surfaces are a great uh, medium to use art. Um, I've often gone to Royal Academy of Art and picked up young artists from there and commissioned them to do like um, a recent one was a house in Chelsea, um, in Chelsea and it was the boundary wall where, where a lot of the house windows were overlooking into and he made a fabulous collage on the wall so um, so that 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 was an art which all the rooms could look into another way I've used is on a on a green wall I've used neon calligraphy as artwork and um, that's another example. And then uh, another artist, Rana Begum, did a beautiful collage for me where, where she used aluminum tubes and painted them in different colors. And um, as you walked up and down, it was in a staircase. And as you walked up and down, the colors kept changing. So um, yeah, and I use biophilic design, which is the connection to nature. So a lot of like yeah. uh, natural looking wallpapers, if you bring them inside, you bring nature in instantly inside. So yeah, yeah, yeah. surfaces are great yeah, to use. Interesting. Right. Just layer, I guess. Um, sorry, yeah. no, we're good. In, in yeah. our world, just he keep hearing background noise. <laughs> in our world, Hamish, if I'm Derek, um, we many of our camps are designed where inside is out and outside is in. That uh, that coincidence of language, uh, design-wise. And, um, and Beverly does a lot of the photographic art that we hang in the inside of the camp, hanging on canvas inside the camp, but representing what's out there. And uh, I must say that for me, one of the greatest highlights of that is when we have swallows coming in and starting to nest and build onto her artwork, uh, physically coming inside of the space and building on it. And it took us some time to to convince the managers in these camps to not destroy the swallows' nests, but to have them as an organic um, dialogue between the, the animals that we were representing outside and whatever the art was inside. And I think uh, there's something um, quite unique or um, special about that. And the other aspect um, of the art without, uh, you know, the canvas is if we camp is positioned in a way that uh, we creating a frame to look out at the art that is nature. I mean, Mora Plains is a great example. You arrive and all that you see in the forest is this tiny little uh, window. You've got to then walk through a swing bridge um, over a river, but you always see the window with this little tree. And as you get to the main area, it all unfolds. And we've tried to do that kind of art um, without the frame um, in all the camps, you know, the positioning up of high up in the Tulu Hills at Altania. So each and every one has a blend of that, but we also use a lot of the art from Maasai culture, uh, especially their colors and their shukas and their beading. The beading is phenomenal. And a lot of um, the framing in the uh, rooms, you know, might even have beaded curtains. So whatever we can uh, create through the natural culture is important for us to create an added art of uh, the fine art images that we put in all the camps. And in fact, in that tent, that uh, camp that Beverly was talking about, Mara Plains camp, uh, we designed the tent opening as you arrive in, in the perfect 1.82 to 1 proportion, the Fabonacci uh, uh, proportions uh, that so represent the skill photography frame. Uh, and so frame upon frame upon frame into infinity is, was, the, was the ambition. Yeah. Wow, it sounds so fascinating. And I think it's just really obvious with um, everyone who uh, 
well, I talk to at the moment that everyone's trying to achieve that sort of blending the indoors and outdoors together, even Minotti London, Minotti, who are sponsoring today's whole, whole um, event, they have their collection divided between indoor and outdoor, and it's, it's just really obvious, therefore, that that is a huge demand moving forward, and it's not going to change anytime soon, and I think services are such a great way to to really sort of take that to a new level as opposed to, you know, biophilic design is wonderful, but actually having like materials that you can touch, tactile materials and, you know, materials that have come locally sourced as well. It makes all the difference. I have one final question for you all, unless anyone wants to submit any other questions. And that is a quite an easy question for me, but it's just what is your favourite material on the market at the moment? What's something that's really impressed you that, you know, the qualities just go above and beyond all others? George, I'm going to come to you first. You know, <laughs> the interior design uh, geek. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to go for the humble ceramic tile. I think mm. uh, there are so many wonderful companies uh, creating beautiful finishes with ceramic tiles. Uh, you can use them internally and externally, depending on the finish. There's matte finishes, there's glaze finishes, there's oxidized finishes. Um, with, with the proviso that you're buying it from a company that you know, maybe use a solar power to heat up the tile, because obviously, as per our previous conversation, you need to heat up clay to create a ceramic tile, right? Um, but I, I think it's very flexible. It creates texture, it creates color. I'm going for the ceramic tile. Okay, what about you, Fameed? I think I'd have to go with the thing I started with, leather um, and faux leather, really, um, because it's just so versatile. I mean, apart from the upholstery and the, the flooring and the paneling that you can do with it. And we're, you know, we're water molding it now. So we, we've just created something that looks like a Georgian plaster ceiling and we've replicated it in white le leather that's water molded. Um, it's just so versatile and I think it's timeless. It's a, it's a mm. timeless material and you can do so much with it. Mm. And what about you, Shalini? Well, uh, Famid was talking about these market tree, um, uh, market tree wallpaper. I want to, I want to look at what it is that intrigues me. But I absolutely love market tree, and um, I think it's such an amazing skill. I love craftsmanship, and it's it it has the most stunning effects. You can you, you can uh, create figurative scenery. You can make abstract shapes, geometry, all like really in living, um, making a space really alive. It can be applied to panels, furniture, doors, small objects. It could be made out of straw, wood, now wallpaper. So, um, so I'm, I'm quite curious now for me to see your wallpaper. I'll be in touch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and finally, Derek and Beverly, what would you say in your in your journey has been the material that's really sort of stood out as a really sort of good material for what you're trying to create with your camps? You know, I would definitely say um, copper, the copper bars, the copper basins. Um, and then, of course, you know, we can have them hand beaten into various designs um, or even copper lights. And the reason why I love it, it brings an authentic feel. It does bring us back to that historic time. Uh, but it brings an incredible warmth and glow to the room. Um, many would see it as uh, possibly very luxurious to have a copper bath. Uh, but it is um, more about the warmth. I mean, we can even have copper furnaces in, in the, um, you know, in the tents. So it's very durable. You can use it in every way possible. And of course, especially in today's time, um, very easy to clean uh, to make sure that it's going to be sterile and absolutely, you know, without bacteria on it. So I would definitely go with that. Yeah. So this is a bit of their own thing. Were you going to go with yeah. something else? Um, I think that mine would be a uh, cotton duck canvas, so, so Egyptian cotton as a decor element or even as, a, as part of the design. Um, they're again a storytelling. So as far back as the, the second or third century, um, people were coming down on these trade winds out of Arabia on the Kizkazi winds down the coast of Africa on, on wooden dows with that triangular shaped cotton sail. And they could only travel for six months of the year, then they had to wait for the wind to change because they couldn't tack. Um, and so there's a great authentic, again, tradition to the way that you use, you know, cotton. Um, and so we, I use it wherever we can, in, um, in screens, in walls, in everything. And I love the, um, 
the fact that it's transient and that it speaks to the fact that we're only here for a small period of time and then we shouldn't leave anything behind and cotton will disappear. That's fascinating. So between you all, we've got a great mood board there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if everyone's writing notes. Thank you so much. Um, honestly, it's been such a fantastic conversation. So George Kuyas, Hamid Khalik, Shalini Misra, and uh, Beverly and Derek Shoba, you guys have been fantastic. And don't forget that you can catch this on on demand on the Hotel Designs website uh, in a few weeks' time. Just before we go, just want to let you know our next session is at 2 p.m. and that will be on social spaces in 2021 and beyond. We've got designers waiting in the wings to discuss social areas, really important topic at the moment. Um, and I promise I will limit the words COVID-19 throughout that conversation because I feel as if that movement was happening far beyond COVID-19 and the pandemic. So we're going to be concluding things with that session at 2 p.m. Katie Phillips is sharing the link in the chat. So if you're quick, you can click on that link, type out your details and you can join us on that session. One final time, thank you to all of our product watch pitch partners. Thank you to Monotti London for sponsoring Hotel Designs Live and thank you to our amazing speakers. See you at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.